curiosity killed the cat. But for a while, I was a suspect. The great Stephen Wright. Well, hey there. Welcome to the Retirement Answer Man Show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. And this is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but actually have the confidence to lean in and rock retirement, rock life, regardless of what's going on in the world. Been thinking and chatting with friends about curiosity recently, and I think this is important. This is an important quality for you and I to nurture, especially as we get older. Now, curiosity, that's pulling on threads. That's what I think about. Have you ever had a shirt or maybe a scarf? Let's use a scarf as an example that has a loose thread. And you start pulling on that and you pull a little bit more and you pull a little bit more and you eventually you just can't stop pulling that thread. You're just fascinated with it. What happens to that scarf? It actually transforms itself. It's no longer a scarf. In this example, it would become this big ball of, I guess, string or yarn or whatever it was made out of. And just by pulling that, you can transform something. Curiosity is like that. We have threads that present themselves that we can decide to pull or not. And maybe we start pulling one and we lose interest and we see another one that attracts our attention and we start pulling that one for a little bit. That is essentially what learning is, is being curious and pulling on things and going a little bit deeper on them. This reminds me of a conversation I had with one of my good friends over a glass of wine probably 10 years ago now. It was right around the time Apple was coming out with Apple stores. And he and I were chatting and we pulled on a thread of why are they opening up Apple stores? How can that make sense for them? They're not in the retail business. Now, that was a passing thought that we could have let move on and gone on to another subject. But instead, we spent probably a half an hour or so pulling that thread and working through the mental gymnastics of, I think we got down to what they would have to make an hour to justify having an Apple store. It was an interesting exercise in thinking. And then we moved on to another subject, pulling threads, being curious. It doesn't have to be about an Apple store. It could be about a friend that said something that happened in their life and pulling that thread with the friend to go deeper on something that's important to them or a child or your spouse. There's so many conversations that have these little loose threads that we could go a lot deeper on. And where I think this is important for you to pull some threads is in this idea around retirement and whether you're not retired yet or you're in retirement of what are you going to do with your life? What's your purpose now that you're not VP of XYZ? This is a big question that people struggle with. We have meetups in the club about navigating transitions because you're shedding identities. We've talked about that before. Where curiosity comes in is that finding what your purpose in life is, and doesn't have to be anything grandiose, is not likely going to be done through a dream or journaling or whiteboarding. It's going to be done by pulling threads and finding threads that are interesting. And then eventually you may stumble on a one that is interesting enough that you just can't stop pulling. That is how we find what we're supposed to be doing in life. All these things begin with the end in mind, etc. That may resonate for you, and that's awesome if it does. But for many of us, me included, I don't know. I pull threads. I don't know what my purpose in my life is. Now, I have told you my purpose professionally, and I think for my life, is this. This podcast, what I talk about, helping you steward yourself to leaning in and rocking retirement regardless of what's going on in the world. That's my purpose for myself. Is that God-given? How did I come up with that? When I was talking with my brother-in-law about this, I basically told him the reason it's my purpose. I remember the moment I said, this is what the show is going to be called. This is what we're going to think about for and noodle on and try to build ways to help people do things. I decided. I decided this is what it is. 
It's not like I saw heaven open up and tell me. I used to pray about it a lot, and I finally came down on the word trust, and essentially I felt that God was saying, hey, Roger, just trust. Do it. Lean in. I'll knock you on your butt if it's wrong or redirect you. And so I've just pulled the thread and pulled the thread. So I encourage you, I say all this to encourage you, if you're struggling with this, is to be curious. Just think of it as an action. You're going to pull lots of threads and it's okay if you change over and over again. With that, we're going to move on and answer your listener questions. If you have a question for the show, you can go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger and leave a question. You can type it in. You can leave an audio question. We try to elevate those. We'll have a few of those today. So our first question today comes from, who does this come from? Anonymous. Ooh, I like anonymous. Okay. Anonymous wants to know, how do I determine if an annuity is the correct path for me in retirement? So within the structure of retirement planning, I would call this an optimization question around finding the right pathway that fits this person's preferences in how they operate, maybe financially, but most likely psychologically. So they say, I am a newly retired 64-year-old, my wife is 62, and I'm considered a PAW if you calculate by old calculation. I have no idea what a PAW is. We have not started Social Security yet. Virtually all calculators show that I should be okay with my retirement funds and expected spending for the next 25 to 30 years. Assuming inflationary times and a possible flat market over the next decade or so, how do I determine if an annuity might be a solution for any possible future scenario if I can input my particular financial situation? Are there rules you go by or calculators that would give me some insight that an annuity at a certain cost would be beneficial or not. I wish to stay away from salespeople and get full research on my own with an independent financial advisor. Any feedback is appreciated. Ah, pause, prodigious accumulator of wealth from Dr. Stanley's millionaire next door. Okay. So how do you know whether an annuity is right for you? And you, you said that all the financial calculators that you've used, and you used a plural, so you, you've used a number of them, say that statistically you should be fine relative to your spending forecasts, but you still feel a little bit uncertain. If you were to purchase an annuity with whatever portion of your assets and had guaranteed income for the rest of your life, I don't think that uncertainty is going to go away. In fact, I know that uncertainty will not go away because that's something we will never be exonerated of regardless of what pathway that you choose, annuity or no annuity or anywhere in between because it's a dial, it's not binary. So how do you know if an annuity is right for you? Well, you have to think of it in two ways. Number one is quantitatively, just by the numbers. Now, a social security is the best annuity that you can get. So you want to make sure you maximize that with the COLA adjustments. So your claiming strategy on Social Security is important from that aspect. Where in there, I wouldn't think about break-even points. I would just think about maximizing the guaranteed payments for you and your spouse if you're married. The timing of annuities, if you purchase an income annuity, I'm assuming we're talking about where you're buying guaranteed income, a guaranteed income source. If you buy one early, that's going to smooth out the risk of an early poor sequence of return, which is beneficial, but then you're going to bring on inflation risk because that annuity payment will be fixed for your life or for both lives and will degrade over time in terms of purchasing power. If you purchase one later, then that is going to allow you to buy later life longevity protection and have the benefit of mortality credits, and we don't need to go into what those are today. Now, Schwab has an annuity income calculator that you can use to get an idea of what types of payments you might get, and you can interact with that calculator without having to talk to somebody that actually sells an annuity, so that can give you some framework. But my recommendation would be is that you build out a feasible, resilient plan of record of how you're actually going to pay for retirement without an annuity using whatever retirement calculators you're using. And then use that base scenario to create a what-if scenario 
simulating, well, what if I took X amount of money and bought an annuity that paid me on this date, guaranteed income for the rest of my life? When you create that what if scenario against your base scenario, that's going to give you some context to make a judgment call because that's all it's going to be. You'll be able to stress test both plans. Well, what happens if I have a bad sequence of return? How much more resilient is my plan with and or without the annuity? How do they look? What happens if I have a healthcare shock? How do both the base scenario and the what if scenario interact? So you'll be able to tease out the impact of having more guaranteed income. And so that's how I would approach the quantitative side. When you do this, it will not be crystal clear. Generally, it is not crystal clear. And this will end up becoming a judgment call on your part. You can make a judgment call from the quantitative part, but the second aspect of this is going to be the qualitative part of this. And we've talked about this, and I know Wade Fowl and with Rissa is doing some work on this of, Remember that the goal of this show is that you have the confidence to lean in and rock retirement. So you're going to want to do some work on what fits you and your family. What is going to give you the confidence to rock retirement? And this is not a quantitative number. If purchasing an annuity and having guaranteed payments from the annuity plus Social Security cover your base great life gives you comfort so you don't have to worry so much so you can actually spend some money, then it doesn't matter what the the, the money side says. You do it because it positions you to go live the life that you want. That is just as important and is not a subset of whether it makes sense money-wise. It cannot make sense from a money standpoint, but if it allows you to have the confidence to live your life, then it may be the right decision for you. That's really important. And Rissa helps you tease that out. Other personality tests can help tease that out because we're all a little wired a little bit differently and what gives us comfort. Once you have that, then the question becomes, when do I do this? Let's assume that you want an annuity from a qualitative standpoint. Now it's, do I do this today or do I plan to do this later in life so I can turn on the easy button later? You say that you are, what, 62. So perhaps if you decide, yeah, this is something I want, but I want to maintain some optionality right now because you're 62, you're young, life's going to change a lot and you're going to change your mind of what's important to you a lot because you're just entering the season of retirement. Maybe you stick with the non-annuity approach but you set aside a little bit of money with the idea that at some point in the future, I plan on buying an annuity in order to make it much easier for me when I'm older and I'm more settled into what I want in this phase of my life. So that timing aspect comes into play. So doing your research is definitely important, but usually the research becomes around product-specific stuff, and that's not really where you're going to find your answer. It's going to be first, quantitatively, does this make sense? And then I think a lot of this is going to be qualitatively, how much do I want more of a safety first approach, to borrow Wade's term. Our next question actually came from a client. (laughs) It was, how do I actually apply for Social Security? And I actually had that question in the span of two or three months in various situations. So I thought I would share how you actually apply for Social Security. We have a couple options. Number one, you can go online and set up My Social Security if you haven't already done that. And you can do that at ssa.gov. So you definitely want to do that. And you can walk through the process of signing up for Social Security. Or number two, you can do it by phone. The main Social Security Administration phone number is 800-772-1213. Or you can do it in person at a local field office. And typically this is used as a last resort, but depending on where you live, that might be the best option. I know in certain areas that I've had client interaction with that the field office is like a local coffee shop. It's easy to go in. So those are the three ways that you would do it. It's going to take online anyway, about 10 to 30 minutes to complete, and they provide a checklist. So that's how you apply for Social Security. Our next question comes from Scott related to some part-time work that he does. So let's check out Scott's question. Good morning, Roger. Long-time listener. My name is Scott. 
My wife and I retired two years ago at 55 and have not looked back. So thank you for all the advice. Part of my health plan is continuing to referee high school and local soccer matches. As a result, I receive a 1099 from my soccer organization and am considered an independent contractor. My question is, can I contribute to my Roth since our joint income is less than the 2022 limit of $208,000? Thank you. Look forward to the uh, response. Hey, Scott. Great, great question. You can contribute to a Roth IRA as long as you have earned income to support the contribution and you are below the income limits that you mentioned. So you're getting this 1099 income from doing coaching work. So you can contribute to a Roth up to the amount that you actually earn doing the position. So if you earned $3,000 as a 1099, then you can contribute up to that amount as a Roth contribution. Our next question actually is a clarification that Tom wanted to share, and it was regarding doing a backdoor Roth contribution, which I entered a few weeks ago. And he's, his wife says, go green, go white. So Sparty on, been a rough year for the Spartans in football anyway. And Tom wanted to take my answer a little bit further of if you contribute a non-deductible contribution to an IRA and then convert that to a Roth, which is a backdoor Roth contribution, that works. And he just wanted to make sure people remembered that, hey, if you have money in an IRA, that the IRS isn't going to see that one contribution as a non-deductible and then the conversion as just a separate transaction. They don't even really acknowledge that or mention backdoor Roth. It's not something that the IRS has. This is just how the rules work. So say you have, and I'm using Tom's example, you have $554,000 in a pre-tax IRA, and then you contribute $6,000 to a non-deductible IRA, then convert the $6,000, it's going to look at the amount of that $6,000, it's going to aggregate it with the monies that are already in the pre-tax IRA, and so 99% of that conversion is going to be taxable because it's, you must prorate it between all of the assets within the IRA. And that's a great point that Tom brought up that I didn't expand my answer to. So if you're doing backdoor Roth contributions, it's best practice not to have money in IRAs. That's one reason why you want to keep, you know, I have clients at times where we'll keep money in a 401k just so we can do backdoor Roth contributions because 401k assets don't count. So thanks for pointing that out, Tom. Always good to get more detail on questions so we don't get ourselves into some trouble. Our next question comes from Mike, and it's related to health care coverage before Medicare, which is going to be an optimization question. Mike says, I am single, 60 years old, and retired May of 21. Since then, I've been on the COBRA coverage that my employer offers, but that ends in October, so we're a little bit tardy in this question. So, Mike, apologize for that. And so he needs to begin to evaluate health coverage. And he has significant pre-tax IRA accounts that he's aggressively doing Roth conversions with, which is great, but the income reporting associated with taking may move him out of eligibility for the Affordable Care Act discounts or credits. And he says he's a big fan of health savings accounts, and he's looked at that options in the fall, and he just wanted some perspective. So Mike, one on the Affordable Care Act subsidies. So the way the subsidies were originally written is that if you made over a certain amount, roughly 400 times the poverty rate, that you would get zero subsidies on your health care premiums, which is basically a rebate from the government. So you have lesser expense for health care coverage. When COVID happened, they changed that to where it wasn't a cliff where if you earned $1 over, you got zero subsidies. They changed it to it's capped at roughly 8.5% of what your income is, which would include those Roth conversions you're talking about. That provision that was put in place with during COVID was supposed to expire this year, but they extended it through 2025. So through 2025, when it comes to Affordable Care Act coverage, it's actually capped about 8.5% of what your income is will be what your premiums for insurance will be. So the cliff isn't near as drastic as it used to be. Now, when you're making these decisions 
on do I do heavy Roth conversions or do I solve for Affordable Care Act subsidies and lower my my payments on my health insurance premiums. It's going to come down to a judgment call, but I would encourage you, and it sounds like you're doing this, Mike, but to think in multi-year, in the timeline of your taxable life, because it's very easy to solve for lower health care premiums now by not doing, say, Roth conversions. And then what you're building up is because you have so much pre-tax assets that later on you're going to have a bigger tax liability when it comes to drawing money from those IRAs. So it's very easy to take the short-term benefit and that could really impact you on the long-term. So I like that you're thinking in a multi-year capacity here. Now you're 60 years old and you asked about a health savings account as an option. And to have a health savings account, you need to have a high deductible policy my wife and I, we have a health savings account eligible ACA plan, and I think our deductible is around, right around 10000 So we pay 100% of our expenses up to $10,000, and then, it, then it's covered by the insurance. So it's more catastrophic insurance. And because we have that, we can contribute to a health savings account, and that's a tax-deductible contribution. Now, at 60, is this too long? You only have five years if you were to buy a health savings account qualified plan. Is this too late? meaning that you won't get the benefit of the tax-free growth within the health savings account. Maybe, maybe. It's going to depend, I think, on your health care use. Get a plan that if you're a heavy user of health care, a health savings account might not be appropriate for you. If you don't have assets to pay for out of pocket the heavy use of health care, a health savings account might not be appropriate for you. If you simply get the tax deductible contribution for the HSA and leave it as cash, there's some tax benefit there, but I don't think you're maximizing it. One way to rethink about this, Mike, would be or reframe it is you have five years, roughly four or five years, to make tax deductible contributions that you can invest like a Roth account that would grow tax free as long as you withdraw the money for qualified medical expenses. My guess is you're going to have more than enough qualified medical expenses if you keep track of them over the years. Because one attribute of an HSA is that if I incur a health expense this year, I can submit it 10 years from now as a qualified expense. So I can build up these qualified expenses to submit for reimbursement for my health savings account out into the future. So If you're really focused on getting money into Roth or more tax-advantaged accounts, maybe four years of doing a high HSA plan is appropriate. But that's some of the things to consider there. Our next question comes from Richard related to highly compensated employee and 401k plans. Richard says, hey, Roger, I wanted to get your thoughts on my options for someone who's considered a highly compensated employee for their employer. Recently, I reached a salary range where I'm no longer able to contribute to the company 401k because I'm now considered a quote unquote highly compensated employee. This is new territory for me and I'm not sure where to put my money. What are my options? All right, Richard, let's think through this. So let's explain first what a highly compensated employee means within the 401k space. So a 401k is a retirement plan. We're familiar with that. And it's regulated by ERISA, which is regulatory framework within the Department of Labor. And every year, a 401k plan goes through testing to make sure it doesn't discriminate against normal employees in favor of, quote unquote, highly compensated employees, which you fall into, Richard. The definition of highly compensated employee can have a number of components, including nationwide raw number raw dollar amounts, so we won't have to get into that. But essentially, as a highly compensated employee, you are not allowed to contribute a larger percentage of your earnings to your 401k than what the average employee at the company does. So if the other employees contribute 7%, then you can only contribute 7%. Although that 7% for you is going to be of of a much higher number. So unless your average employees are contributing 0%, you're not going to be completely excluded from contributing to the 401k. You're just going to be leveled based on the average compensation of all employees. And this is the annual testing that happens with 401k, with 401k plans. 
So what do you do with those extra dollars that you're getting that would have gone into the 401k? Well, you know, there's a cascade effect you can think of similar to talking using an HSA as an investment strategy. If you have an HSA available to you, that's one way of getting money in as a tax deductible amount. And then you could save that for current healthcare premiums and still get the tax deduction to go in because there's no limit on the amount for the, you know, and your earnings for that. Or you could use that as sort of a hyped up Roth account and invest it over time. You could do backdoor Roth contributions if you do, don't have outside IRAs. So you could make a non-deductible contribution to an IRA and then convert that to a Roth. Or you could do regular taxable brokerage accounts. So you would just go down the hierarchy of what you could pick. But it's likely you're not totally excluded, but it sounds like you're constrained. And maybe you could lobby your employer to help get the average contribution level up of employees and get more participation because that would help you or explore the safe harbor clauses that are available. Like we have a safe harbor clause in my 401k, where as an employer, I agree to match roughly dollar for dollar up to 4% of contributions. And by doing that, I get out, I exclude myself from all of this discriminatory testing that your 401k is going through. So those are some thoughts there, Richard. Hopefully that helps you out. With that, let's move on to a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to take a little baby step we can take in the next seven days to not just rock retirement, but rock life. Okay, in the next seven days, I want you to pull a thread. It could be in a conversation you're having over Thanksgiving. It could be in a thought that you're thinking that you go explore more or in something that you're reading. It could be in a random conversation or observation within the world that you don't just let pass by, but you pull on a little bit and explore a little bit with the mindset of not judgment, not that you're trying to determine anything, just out of curiosity. That's my challenge to you. I bet you all like it. There's such a long list of people and things to be thankful for. It's a good exercise to do. I try to do it every day. I think I'm actually pretty good at it. Definitely thankful for you and being on this journey with me. I'm thankful for Nicole and for the entire team, Kim, Tracy, Laura. Oh, when I start listing people, I get confused. You know who you are. I care about you guys. I care about you rocking retirement, and I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance. Performance reference is historical and does not guarantee future results. All indices are unmanaged and cannot be invested in directly. Make sure you consult your legal, tax, or financial advisor before making any decisions.